What is going on guys? Welcome back to the algorithms and data structures tutorial series. Now we're going to start with sorting algorithms and in today's episode we're going to talk about the bubble sort. So let us get right into it. Now before we get into the actual video I want to mention that the Bible of algorithms and data structures, the book for this tutorial series is out on Amazon available as a paperback and as an ebook already so you can buy it if you want you don't have to as i already mentioned in the first video if you want to supplement this tutorial series and want to learn these things more in depth in a more structured way you can buy this book the bible of algorithms and data structures otherwise you can just continue to watch this series for free um you can check out the link in the description it's a hyper url link that is based on your location so if you're in germany you got the german link if you're in india you get an indian link if you're in the us you get the amazon.com link uh, so check out the link in the description and uh, you can buy the book on Amazon if you want to. So let us get right into the bubble sort algorithm. We're going to look at a bubble sort algorithm, which is a very inefficient sorting algorithm. I can spoil that surprise for you. Uh, it's mostly taught because of educational uh, purposes. So you want to teach people what sorting looks like, what sorting is. And you start with bubble sort, insertion sort, selection sort and so on. Uh, later on, we're going to use divide and conquer algorithms like quick sort and merge sort. We're going to talk about these as well. But let's start out with bubble sort. Let's say we have a list like four, six, five, uh, two, one, three. This is the list that we have and we need to sort this list. Now, the bubble sort algorithm has a certain way of solving this problem. We talked about problems already. Problems are goals that we have, tasks that we want to accomplish. And an algorithm solves these problems uh, or this problem using a set of instructions. So this problem is sorting the list. We want to end up obviously with a list that looks like uh, this one, two, three, four, five, six. And we want to do this in an algorithmic way using a set of instructions. Now the bubble sort algorithm, before we go into the actual pseudocode and the actual uh, steps, we're going to just talk about the intuition here. Um, basically what it does is it takes the first number here and compares it to its neighboring number to the next number and you can see four six is in the right position so we just accept this as sorted we accept these two numbers each other uh, or in their context of these two numbers they're sorted so four is less than six and that's fine uh, when we have done that we have looked at the first two positions then we look at the second position we take six and compare it to its next neighbor so to five and you can see six is less than five which is uh, six is larger than five, but it's in the position uh, before five. So that's not okay. And we swap these two numbers. So now we end up with four, six, uh, sorry, four, five, six, two, one, three. Then what we do is we compare six to two and we see, okay, six is again, less uh, larger than two, but in the position it's before two. So we say four, five, two, six, and so on. And you can see where this goes. It basically says, uh, or it basically ends up with six in the end and all the other elements get swapped before six. So you get four, five, two, one, three, six in the end. Now, as you can see, this list is not sorted. Why is it not sorted? Because we only uh, positioned one element where it should be. Only the element six is in the right position in this case. So what we can do next is we can just repeat the process. So we go ahead and say, okay, four, five, still all right. Um, five, two is not all right. So we have four, two, five. Then again, we compare it to one. We can say, okay, it's also four, two, one, five, three, the same shit. So like that. And the question now is how many times do we need to do that in order to sort the list? And as you can see in each iteration, we have one element that it, that is at right position. Basically what we're doing is we're filtering out the largest element and shifting it as right as possible. So we started with six. We noticed that six is the largest element and then whatever we compared it to um, was less than six. So it ended up in the maximum position, the last position. Then six was already the maximum and we repeated the process. Five was the largest number. So every time we met five, we put it, um, we, we, we shifted it to the right. Now, of course, in this list, uh, this may be the case like that, but sometimes you're also going to have something like um, three, two, one, and then five, uh, or not five, let's say six, five, four. 
So you're going to shift values that are not the maximum values. So three and two is also not the right order. So you're going to say two, three, um, then two, one, three, uh, even though three is not the maximum number, it's the maximum number of this subset here. So you're always going to just pick one number and then swap it if it's not in the right position compared to its next neighbor. So you're going to look at is this number, uh, is it justified that this number is before the other number? So three is larger than two, but it comes before two. So that's not justified. We swap it. Uh, then the same thing with three and one. Uh, but then you see, okay, three and six, you can see three is less than six. So it's justified and six is the new number that we're going to look at. And then six is larger than five. So it's not justified and you swap it basically. So since one element with each iteration, one extra element, at least is ending up in the right position. Uh, this has to be done a maximum amount of n times because when you do this n times this process that we just discussed, you're going to end up with a sorted list because in the first iteration, six is at the right position, then five, then four, then three, then two, then one, and then the list is sorted at at least uh, or at the maximum iterations of n uh, or after a maximum of n iterations, you're going to have a sorted list, because then you have uh, put n elements into the right position and the list has n elements. So this is the basic intuition behind the bubble sort. And we're now going to look at the pseudocode. So now let us look at the pseudocode here. And this pseudocode is a very simple one. Uh, basically, the first line just tells us this is a function called bubble sort, we pass a list to it, this list can be whatever it is, you know, one, two, seven, six, three, four, whatever, you have a list and you pass it into this function. And then you have two loops. The first loop runs from i equals zero to the size of the list. So if you have one, two, three, this is a list of size three. If you have uh, five, six, six, seven, eight, it's a list of size five, obviously. Um, so depending on this, uh, on the list size, you can say the list size is n. And then you already can see that this loop runs n times. Um, so n is a list size, and we run a loop from zero to n to the list size. Uh, inside of that loop, we, we run another loop from j equals zero to the size of the list minus i minus one, this might be a little bit confusing. Now, first of all, this first loop here tells us that we need to run this whole thing n times, because we're not checking is the list already sorted. So if you have the list, for example, one, two, uh, three, four, six, five, after one iteration, it's going to be sorted, but we don't check for that. So it's going to run through all these loops, uh, through all these iterations, even though the list is sorted already. We don't check for that in this particular algorithm in this particular pseudocode. So what we do is we definitely run this loop n times the process that we just discussed of comparing we run this n times. Um, but we don't compare all the digits. So if you have a list like five, six, four, one, three, two, uh, after one iteration, we said already that one element is going to be at the right position. So you're going to end up definitely no matter what you do in between, the six is going to be at the last position. So we don't have to care about the six anymore. We don't have to care about the maximum element, it's going to be sorted for itself, it's in the proper position. Uh, doesn't matter what happens to the list in between. If we swap four and five, if we swap one and four, we doesn't it doesn't matter the six is going to end up in the maximum position where it belongs. So we can ignore the six actually, no matter what the list looks like, the six is sorted already. And we can go ahead and say, okay, we only have five, four, one, three, and two to sort. So we sort one less element. After one iteration, we have one less element to look at. And this is why we subtract I here, because I is essentially how many iterations did we have already? Because what happens if I had two iterations? If I had two iterations, the six is at the proper position and the five is at the proper position as well. At least there might be other elements that are also in the proper position already. But these two elements are for sure without needing to check it, uh, check for it, these two elements are going to be at the at the proper position at the position they belong to. So we can ignore the five and we have two less elements to look at. So with each iteration that we do, we have uh, one less element to look at. So after two iterations, we have two less elements after three iterations, three less elements. So I is the amount of iterations 
and we subtract i, the amount of iterations, from how many elements we have to look at. And the minus one is very simple. Uh, if you have an array and you look, or a list, and you look at the element six, you compare it to the next element. If you look at the element four, you compare it to the next element. So you're not going to look at two because you don't have a next element. The only thing that you need to do is you need to look at three and compare it to two. You don't compare two to something else. So you stop one element before you le uh, reach the list size. You don't look at the last index. This is what you basically do. And then uh, what do you actually do inside of this loop is you compare the elements. So what you do is you say, I do this n times. And what do I do n times? I look at all these elements. So I compare five to six. And if five is larger than six, I swap the elements. In this case, it's not. So I ignore it. I don't do anything. Then I go back to the loop. Now I compare six to four. Yes, six is larger than four. I swap the elements. And I do this one iteration. Then I increase i by one and I only look at the first five um, of these numbers. So let's go through the process. We have five, then we compare six to four, then it's four, then six to one, it's one, six to three, six to two. And this is the list that we end up after the first iteration. So now I is two and we can ignore six because it's already sorted and we only look at this list here. So I get subtracted, one gets subtracted here. And I repeat the same process. So what I do is I compare five to four. Okay, so we swap them for one, three, two, five. And I can say, okay, five is sorted. Where's the red color? Five is sorted. So I ignore it. And I only look at this list. And I do this n times. So in the end, I only end up with the one there. And the list is sorted. This is essentially what the pseudocode means. So let's use the mathematical skills that we already have in order to analyze this algorithm. And we can look at these two loops here, or actually before we do that, let's look at these two lines here. We have one primitive operation right here, which is a comparison, and one primitive operation right here, which is a swap. Since we're analyzing the worst case runtime complexity, what we need to do is we need to assume that every time we enter the if statement, so every time we have two primitive operations, this is the worst case, uh, this would be a list like six, five, four, three, two, one. So every time we would have this element sorted, and it would end up uh, in the end, but then we have this completely unsorted list and only five would change place. So every time we would have to uh, go ahead and swap the elements. This is the worst case scenario for the bubble sort. Uh, this list obviously, or not list, sorry, this loop obviously gets executed n times because it gets executed as many times as the list has size. So as many elements that there are in the list. And the second loop here is, uh, being executed n minus i times. Now we can write this down in a sigma notation again, which essentially means we start uh, at, and this is the tricky part here, we start at one, I'm going to tell you why, uh, and we have n minus i times, and this two times, because here we have two primitive operations with each uh, iteration, the amount of iterations is the outer loop times the inner loop, and why are we starting to count from one? because uh, the first time we enter this loop, we compare the first element to the second element, the, th uh, th uh, the second element to the third element, the third element to the fourth element, but we don't compare the last element to anything. So we have n minus one operations inside there or iterations inside there. So if we say n minus i, and we start counting at zero, we would have an additional n that is just not accurate. We need to start from n minus one because this loop here, this thing here starts running from actually this is not true what I wrote here it's n minus i minus one but we're not going to write minus one in here we're going to just increase uh, the starting point of i by one this is actually the the exact uh, amount of steps that we need I tried this with a Python script and it was the exact result because you start counting from uh, when you start counting from one the first iteration of the second loop runs n minus one times, which is actually the case because it runs n minus one times. Um, so this is why you start counting from one, you have two times because you have two primitive operations. And again, we can just use Wolfram alpha to tell us what this is. It's the sum of n minus i from i equals one to n. This is what we're looking at. And you can see it's n minus one times n divided by two. But remember, we have this two in front of here. So essentially, what we end up with is two times 
n times n minus 1 divided by 2. So this cancels out and we can just ignore the 2 here. And what we end up with is, let me find the right color again, um, is n times n minus 1. This is, of course, n squared minus n. And this is, of course, in big O of n squared. We're going to specify the big O here instead of the theta notation because we're interested in the worst case runtime complexity, not in the average case or in the exact amount of steps. Uh, but there is a maximum of n squared uh, steps that we need here, like the, the runtime complexity is n squared. We talked about what that means already. So that's it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it and hope you learned something. Today we covered the bubble sort, a very inefficient algorithm, but a very simple algorithm, easy to understand. Uh, purely educational, you're probably not going to use it in your coding. Uh, when you complete some projects, you're not going to use a bubble sort algorithm, you're going to use merge sort, quick sort, tim sort, whatever. Um, but it is educational and the basis for the next videos we're going to talk about insertion sort, selection sort, and then we're going to get into the more efficient algorithms like uh, merge sort, quick sort that are divide and conquer algorithms. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, let me know by hitting the like button, leaving a comment in the comment section down below. And of course, if you haven't done it yet, subscribe to the channel to see more future videos for free. Other than that, thank you very much for watching. See you in the next video and bye.